Okay, this week we want to look at the Coverdale Bible. The Coverdale Bible is the second of the uh, English Bibles after Tyndall, and the Coverdale Bible is the first Bible. It is the first complete Bible in English. Um, and it is, uh, so it, it, at that level it's very important. Um, the Coverdale Bible is often neglected. It is often ignored. It is often not thought of very highly uh, because sometimes the, the man who is involved with it, Miles Coverdale, is not thought of very highly. So we want to talk about uh, Miles Coverdale. We want to talk about the Bible that bears his name. And I want to clear up some of the misconceptions maybe about Miles Coverdale and uh, um, talk about him a little bit. Miles Coverdale is uh, born in 1488, about. He might have been born in 1486. And he lives until 1569. He lives a very long life for that era. Um, and Miles Coverdale, after William Tyndall, is, in my estimation, the second most important individual in the history of the English Bible in terms of its production and its growth. Miles Coverdale is going to uh, begin his career in Bible translation, his career in the Bible in English, as Tyndale's assistant. He's going to work with Tyndale. He's going to be an editor for Tyndale as he is working on that. He obviously produces the Coverdale Bible. He also edits the Great Bible. And he works on, at least in the initial stages, the Geneva Bible. So four of the, of the English Bibles leading up to the King James, Miles Coverdale is, is intimately involved with. Uh, not only that, and produces uh, um, the one that has come to bear his name. Now, Miles Coverdale, uh, began his life as an Augustinian monk or friar in England, uh, born in 1488 again and, and moving forward. And he stays with the Catholic Church until 1528. So he, stay, he, is, he is 48 years old. He's not a young man. When he finally, the Reformation catches up with him, he buys into the Reformation and he abandons the Catholic Church for Reformation principles. In 1528, that uh, forces him to flee England and move to the continent. Now, while on the continent, he makes a lot of friends. He, he, uh, the difference between Tyndale and uh, uh, Miles Coverdale is, is simply this. Miles Coverdale was much more politically astute than Tyndale. He apparently was much more friendly and personable than Tyndale was. Tyndale was not known as, uh, Tyndale was known as a rather intense, uh, single-minded guy, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. And, and that's true. Coverdale was um, a more friendly, outgoing, made friends easily, um, made important friends easily. Um, and, and Miles Coverdale has the distinct advantage in the work of the production of the English Bible of staying alive. Uh, through all of the changes in administration, through the ups and downs of Henry VIII, through the life of Edward VI, through um, the ascension of Mary, to the ascension of Elizabeth I, Miles Coverdale survives all of that. And, and a lot of times, and I think sometimes the modern inclination is to read back into Coverdale and say, because Coverdale survived, he must have been a compromiser. In other words, if he had been courageous, if he had been like Tyndale, he'd have died. And, 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 and so we elevate, at a certain level sometimes I think we elevate martyrdom to a, a, a level that it really shouldn't be at. That it's, it's, 
it's somehow desirable. It's somehow, and, and this, this goes back to the early church. You had a lot of Christians who believed that martyrdom was uh, uh, um, desirable. That, that it, was, it was not only something that uh, um, would happen to Christians, it was something to be sought out which obviously isn't you know, really a, 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 an expedient way to promote the gospel or promote anything. And um, Coverdale, because he stays alive, is sometimes viewed as, as, as he must have been weak, he must have been a compromiser, he must have waffled and changed his positions on things, when in reality he never did. Uh, Coverdale is a plotter. He was not a brilliant scholar like Tyndale was. And, and his translation, his, his version of the Bible suffers from that. But, but Coverdale also never pretends to be anything he's not. Um, uh, unlike uh, um, John Rogers, who we'll talk about next week, and the Matthews Bible, uh, 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 John Rogers, you know, took a false name to hide himself in, in the production of his Bible because he was afraid of his life. Coverdale put his name on it. It was known as the Coverdale Bible. Everyone knew he was involved in the process. Um, and not only uh, did he work on those four Bibles, he does two other things that aren't as significant, but it shows you the level of productivity that he, that he enjoyed. He produced a diaglot, which is a Latin and English version of the New Testament, and a Latin and English side-by-side -side version of the Psalms. And um, so in his life, he was very, very productive. He was very, very uh, um, a hard worker, but at the same time was politically astute. At the same time, he made friends easily. Those friends would help him along the way. Those friends that he made, and because he, he was um, able to make those friends and make friends in important places, he was able to advance the, the cause of the Bible in English much further than Tyndall ever was. Um, he returned to England in 1535 under the patronage of Anne Boleyn, uh, the, the, the wife of uh, Henry VIII, and, the, uh, uh, and Thomas Cromwell. Now, Thomas Cromwell is important in this case. A, a lot of things that make Coverdale successful uh, uh, kind of converge at the same time. One, you have Coverdale who's, who's good at this. He's politically astute, he's friendly, as we've already said. You have Henry VIII now who has broken from the Catholic Church. He has established the Church of England. He is establishing uh, um, not so much the Protestant Reformation, but what we might call the English Reformation under Henry's guidance. And you have Thomas Cramner, who's the new Archbishop of Canterbury that we'll talk about. Cramner lives from 1489 to 1556. Uh, and, and he's an important individual under Henry VIII's reign because he's, uh, um, he, uh, Cramner is enthusiastic about the production of the English Bible. He is, he is, he is uh, the guy, he really wants this done to the point that he orders his bishops under him to start producing a Bible. But the bishops under him weren't as excited about the project and they just you know never got around to it. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then you also had Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell uh, was born in 1485 and he dies in 1540. And Cromwell is the king's minister. He is the king's first minister. Um, Cromwell was a, a thoroughgoing, bought into the Protestant Reformation. He was exceptionally loyal to Henry VIII. He had engineered uh, um, the, the, one of his divorces. He had worked uh, tirelessly to promote Henry and to promote Henry's agenda. 
Um, the, the problem perhaps with, with uh, Cromwell is that um, he made a lot of en enemies along the way. And, and at the end of his life, he arranged, from, he arranged for he Henry to marry a, a German princess by the name of Anne of Cleves. Um, and, and that was one of the things that he was working on and, and hoped that that would, Anne was uh, thoroughgoingly involved in the Protestant Reformation under Luther's influence. Um, and, and, and the marriage to Anne of Cleves was a disaster at, at every level. It was a disaster for Anne of Cleves. It, it, it only lasted for six months before Henry had it annulled. And Henry by this time, uh, by 1540, Henry's a little um, hard to get along with, and he's a little impetuous, and he had ministers uh, talking to him in his ear, and, and all the people who didn't like Cromwell finally got their way. And Cromwell, because of arranging this marriage, uh, he was uh, um, arrested for treason and heresy, and um, he was executed on the tower on uh, July of 1540. Henry, shortly thereafter, came to uh, deeply grieve what he had done. Uh, he, 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 he deeply, he said he, he had allowed all of these people and their rumors to influence him and, and led to him to execute the, the most loyal and faithful minister he had. And so um, that was uh, uh, um, Cromwell's uh, um, influence along with Cramner's influence. And Cromwell was very uh, um, uh, friendly to, to Miles Coverdale. Well, in, in, in 1540, when Anne Boleyn is obviously off the scene and Cromwell has just been executed, um, Miles Coverdale uh, again leaves England and moves to the continent. And, and he is there for a while and he, he's, he's away from England until 1547. Uh, 1547, Henry VIII dies and Edward VI comes to the throne. And when Edward comes to the throne, Miles Coverdale returns to England where he is uh, very well received. Uh, Edward VI makes him the Bishop of Exeter. And he is there uh, um, mainly when, when, uh, for Matthew Parker's uh, installation as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he and, and Matthew Parker and Miles Coverdale are friendly, although they, they begin to diverge in, in slightly because of the uh, um, uh, um, Pro Protestant Reformation under Elizabeth. Uh, because, of, because of, let me back up, because of Coverdale's strict Puritanism, he will um, um, kind of move away from Matthew Parker who began to, to view Puritanism a little bit more suspiciously. And I, I, I made a mistake there. And, and he returns in um, 1547 uh, until 1553. He leaves the continent again when Mary comes to the throne. And I, I made a mistake there. Apologize for that. Um, when Mary comes to the throne in 1553, Miles Coverdale's life is in danger. Uh, like all of the other Protestant leaders in England, um, he, he's and an, an a high important one as a bishop. Um, he is uh, in danger of being executed. He is saved and allowed to leave England because of the intercession of the King of Denmark. Because Miles Coverdale, won a, 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 along the way, he had become friendly in that court when he was on the continent. He had, he had come to know people. And Miles Coverdale's brother-in-law was the chaplain to the King of Denmark. 
and his brother-in-law makes an appeal to the king. The king of Denmark intercedes to uh, Mary and, and um, requests rather strongly that um, Miles Coverdale be allowed to leave, leave to the continent and go into exile. Um, today, we kind of, you know, we, we have to remember that at that time, Denmark was a powerful country in the European affairs, and England was in turmoil. Um, Mary, um, Mary's reign was always somewhat tenuous because she was uh, uh, trying to align England more with Spain with her husband. And um, Mary, uh, um, Mary and England and her advisors, the last thing they needed was war with Denmark. Because England at this time, remember England is still not the great naval power that it will become under Elizabeth. Um, England is, England's main protection during this time is the fact they're an island. And, and the last thing they need is war with Denmark or, or bad relations with Denmark. And so Coverdale's allowed to um, uh, leave. And he goes, um, he, he goes to Geneva. And he works there with the English congregation in Geneva. That's when he becomes involved with the uh, production of the Geneva Bible. And it is when he becomes the godfather of the minister's second son. The minister in Geneva at this time, who's, who Coverdale becomes the godfather for his son, is none other than John Knox. So he was very, very, obviously very well connected. Um, in 1559, he returns to um, England uh, for Matthew Parker's installation as Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, he never returns though, he, he stays in England the rest of his life for the next 10 years. He really recedes from public work at that time. Uh, he's never restored to his bishopric under Elizabeth because he was much more inclined towards the uh, uh, more strict Puritan view of life. Um, which involved, uh, uh, he would never, he refused to wear the vestments that uh, were required of, uh, of uh, ministers at that time. In other words, when you went to preach and went to perform the church service, you had to wear certain clothing, uh, robes and things like that. And Coverdale and the Puritans refused to do that. And, and even under Elizabeth, Elizabeth had, had brought, uh, under Elizabeth you had the act of uniformity where all the churches, you know, they needed to act the same. And uh, you had the vestment controversy because you had certain Puritan uh, um, ministers, you know, and, and they, would do, they would do things like, oh, I, you know, got to church, I, I left all my vestments at home. You know, well, I'm here and it's time for church, so we'll, I'll just, you know, we'll get by without it. And, and they would do things like that. And, and that, began to, that began to annoy Matthew Parker. And, and, and Parker, and uh, as we're talking about Matthew Parker and, and Miles Coverdale kind of begin to separate a little bit over this. Um, Coverdale's life is never in danger again. He is, he is still well respected. But in terms of public influence, influence at court, he never has that again under Elizabeth because of his, his particular convictions. But at the same time, he's, um, he's no danger to Elizabeth. Elizabeth uh, uh, respects him as an individual, uh, respects his work, especially his work on the Great Bible and the Coverdale Bible. The Coverdale Bible that we're going to talk about in a second, I mean, the Coverdale Bible will go through 20 editions. It, it, it lasts a long time. The Coverdale Bible will still be produced and printed um, even during the times, I think the last printing of the Coverdale Bible is just after the first printing of the Geneva Bible. 
So all during the, the, the time of Matthew's Bible that we'll talk about next week and the Great Bible that we'll talk about next week, the, the Coverdales continued to be produced because it was, uh, um, and, and there's a reason for that, the Coverdale Bible, for the most part, was Tyndale. The Coverdale Bible, New Testament, was Tyndale's work. It was, and, and, and re-edited and kind of brought up to, to date a little bit. Remember, English is really moving now. Um, by the beginning of, of Coverdale kind of spans this, 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 this change from late Middle English to Elizabethan English. And uh, he, he, moves, uh, he moves forward that way. Coverdale's Bible, which is produced in 1535, um, was probably the, uh, at, the, at, at the, the insistence, the uh, financial backing of a, a very wealthy merchant in Antwerp by the name of Jacob Van Merten, M-E-T-E-R-E-N or Metterin, I guess, Jacob von Metterin of Antwerp. And um, he, he produced a, a, a whole Bible in English. Now, he, Coverdale himself did not, was not, did not have facility in Hebrew. So the Hebrew Old Testament, the, 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 the Old Testament is not a translation of the Hebrew into English. It is a, uh, um, it is a translation of the Latin, and it is a translation of Luther's Old Testament. Coverdale was very conversant in German. And so Luther's Old Testament is, is really the primary source for Coverdale to complete the translation of the Old Testament. Uh, he also uses, uh, um, uh, the, a, a Swiss German uh, version of Zwingli that, that Zwingli had produced of the Old Testament, and which is very, but, but Luther's Bible was, was the most influential uh, piece of, of Coverdale's Old Testament uh, translation. It is actually not a bad translation. It, it, and, and, and it is attested to because it remains in print for so long. The uh, question? Okay. Um, Coverdale's Bible is often mistakenly referred to as the first authorized version of the English Bible. And, and I need to tell you the story why, because it's not, um, it's not the first English version that is authorized. It never actually is authorized by Henry VIII. It is, uh, uh, um, it is brought to Henry's attention. And, and, and I'll tell you the story of how this goes. But uh, Henry by this time, by, the, by 1530, 1532, 1533, it was widely understood that Henry wanted an English version of the Bible. Uh, unfortunately, Tyndall's been executed and, uh, um, and he can't work on it anymore. Remember what I told you in the first week that, that Henry VIII was very upset that Tyndall had been executed. Um, he wanted, he had ordered Tyndall to be brought to him. And we really don't know what would have happened had, had Tyndall lived and been brought to Henry VIII as Henry VIII had instructed, we really don't know what the history would have been because by the time Tyndale would have gotten to Henry, his break with the Church of England might have been complete and, and Tyndale might have been allowed to, to function. Although, Tyndale did have, Tyndale was not politically astute. He, he, Real, he wrote a book about Henry's divorces and was highly critical of Henry. So it, it probably, uh, um, if he'd caught Henry on a bad day, he probably might have met his end under Henry as well. But we just don't know. Um, 
Coverdale is, uh, um, his Bible has as an elaborate, um, elaborate dedication to Henry VIII. And here's, here's what happened. Um, Thomas Cramner in 1533 becomes Archbishop of Canterbury who is really enthusiastic about having an English Bible produced. He is, he gets the, he, 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 the, there in 1534, the convocation of Canterbury petitions the king to quote, uh, decree that the Holy Scripture should be translated into the vulgar English tongue by certain good and learned men to be nominated by his majesty and should be delivered to the people for their instruction. And, and that's, that's really the beginning of the Coverdale Bible. Um, Henry, in all likelihood, responded positively to Cramner and told him to, to do it. Although there's just there's no there's no particular information there there's evidence that Cramner himself started to revise Tyndale's New Testament. Um, he he nothing ever came of it though. Uh, uh, the bishops under Cramner's control of Canterbury uh, weren't enthusiastic. Uh, many of them simply were not scholars. They were learned, they were educated, but they were not scholars. They, they didn't see how this was gonna benefit them. Um, and, and so nothing ever happened. And, and, and at the same time, Coverdale is, is creating his Bible. And so it really falls off of the uh, um, uh, 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 chart, uh, the, the track of things to do, because Coverdale's done it. And so now the bishops say, ah, we don't have to do this anymore. We're not interested in it anyway, and now it's been done, so we'll see what happens. Um, and, and so Cromwell, who was, was Coverdale's friend, brings this Bible to Henry VIII's attention. Henry apparently uh, um, takes the information from Cromwell about this Bible, perhaps some uh, uh, copies of it, that had been done. We know that certain bishops had copies of it and uh, distributed it among his ministers and his bishops for their input. This is normally how Henry did things. Um, people think, I mean, Henry could be impulsive, but, but he was also a fairly capable administrator. He did get good advice. And he, he, he tended to, on things like this, to send out the information to his ministers, get their input, and then make the decision for himself. Um, and, and the bishops were always slow to respond. Uh, um, remember, most of the bishops had been Catholic. Uh, England wasn't Catholic anymore. Some of them enjoyed that, some of them didn't. Remember, Henry had uh, uh, taken the church property and, and redistributed it. And some of the bishops were rewarded and some of them weren't. Some of them liked Henry, some of them didn't. Um, some of them had religious scruples against Henry, some of them didn't. And, and so finally, Henry just got tired of waiting and he called them all to the office and said, okay, I need an answer on this. What is, what do you think of this Coverdale Bible? And um, some of them had some criticisms here and there about the translation and this and that. And, and finally, apparently, Henry says this, uh, according to uh, um, um, tradition and also uh, uh, some, some notes by a particular work, well, and Henry says, well, he said, but are there any heresies maintained in this translation? And the assembled bishops finally admitted, no. There, there's nothing heretical in Coverdale's translation. And Henry's response was, if there be no heresies, 
then in God's name, let it go abroad among our people. And that's Henry's authorization. It is verbal. It, it, he never puts his name to a document that authorizes the, uh, the Coverdale Bible to, to be printed, to be used exclusively or anything like that. It is just able to go out and be printed and to be sold and to continue. Um, it, it was by word of mouth. Cromwell and, uh, um, and Cramner uh, um, did everything they could to, to ensure it was uh, uh, um, produced and, and they kind of greased the skids with the printers and things like that to make it happen. And then, uh, um, this will be an interesting read. This is the, the, Coverdale writes a long introduction where he is effusively grateful to Henry VIII. And this is, this is what he writes. This will take me a minute here to read. Considering now, most gracious prince, the inestimable treasure, fruit, and prosperity everlasting that God giveth with his word, and trusting in his infinite goodness that he would bring my simple and good labor herein to good effect. Therefore, as the Holy Ghost moved other men to do the cost thereof, so was I boldened in God to labor in the same. Again, considering your imperial majesty, not only to be my natural sovereign liege lord and chief head of the Church of England, but also the true defender and maintainer of God's law, I thought it my duty and to belong to my allegiance when I had translated this Bible, not only to dedicate this translation unto your highness, but to wholly commit it unto the same, to the intent that if anything therein be translated amiss, for in many things we fail, even when we think to be sure, it may stand in your grace's hands to correct it, to amend it, to approve it, yea, and to clean to, and clean to reject it if your godly wisdom shall think it necessary. And as I do with all humbleness submit mine understanding and my poor translation unto the spirit of truth in your grace, so I make this protestation, having God to record in my conscience, that I have neither rested nor altered so much as one word for the maintenance of any sect but have with a clear conscience purely and faithfully translated this out of five sundry interpreters, which is Luther and, and different uh, translations of the uh, Old Testament, having only the manifest truth of the scripture before in mine eyes, trusting in the goodness of God, that it shall be unto his worship, quietness and tranquility unto your highness, a perfect establishment of all God's ordinances within your grace's domain, a general comfort to all Christian hearts, and a continual thankfulness of both old and young unto God and to your grace for being our Moses and bringing us out of this old Egypt from the cruel hands of our spiritual Pharaoh. For where were the Jews by 10,000 parts so much bound unto King David for subduing of the great Goliath and all their enemies, as we are to your grace, for delivering us out of our old Babylonian captivity. For the, for the which deliverance and victory I beseek our only mediator, Jesus Christ, to make such means for us unto his heavenly Father, that we never be unthankful to, unto him nor unto your grace, but that we ever have increase in the fear of him, in obedience to your highness, in love unfeigned towards our neighbors, and all virtue that cometh to God, to whom for the defending of his blessed word, by your grace's most rightful administration, be honor and thanks, glory and dominion, world without end, amen. 
he knows how to butter up Henry VIII. Henry VIII saw this uh, preface, this introduction, when he got his copy of, of Coverdale's Bible, and he was over the top. He was, he was wildly enthusiastic. Coverdale had uh, um, ingratiated himself to the king. Um, now, obviously, that didn't last because he was very closely associated with Cromwell when Cromwell falls, when Anne Boleyn is off the scene. Uh, Coverdale, who never has a falling out per se with the king, he just thinks it the better part of wisdom to maybe move back to the continent for a while and and to uh, uh, and and um, later and to also he's involved a little bit for a while with the Great Bible kind of from from afar. So that's his relationship with Henry VIII. That's the, that's the Coverdale Bible. Um, it is a, a, an excellent work in many respects. It is um, uh, a work that uh, um, um, really brings the, finally the whole Bible to the English people. His translation of the Psalms is actually very good considering the fact he didn't understand Hebrew. But because he was such a good German scholar and Luther had done such an excellent job in the Psalms, Coverdale Psalms really uh, um, begin to uh, 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 they, they bring the Psalter to the English people. He brings the Psalms to uh, uh, the English speaking world to the church services to the, and, and remember they would sing the Psalms. Uh, um, Coverdale's work was very metrical. Um, they were very easy to sing in Coverdale's translation. And, and he really does a, 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 a nice work. Um, interesting, C.S. Lewis, um, who was one of the great medieval English scholars of all time. C.S. Lewis, I mean, he's well known for the Chronicles of Narnia and things like that. Um, his textbooks on, on 16th and 17th century English literature are still in print, and they are still the standard textbooks in for that discipline. So, uh, C.S. Lewis said this. Uh, um, I'm, I'm quoting from uh, David Daniel. In telling phrases, C.S. Lewis remarked that among the great scholar translators of the 16th century, Coverdale shows like a rowing boat among battleships, which sounds bad, but this gave him a kind of freedom to select and combine by taste. Fortunately, his taste was admirable. So, Coverdale wasn't a frontline, great, biblical language scholar, but he recognized good work when he saw it. And, and he recognized the best parts of the different uh, translations that were available to him that he did understand and could use. Um, a couple of things uh, further in this sentence. Imitating the Swiss and German Bibles, Coverdale coined many compounds. Uh, in other words, the Germans are really good at take two words and put them together and make a compound word. And, um, and, and Coverdale coined many compounds, some of which su survive, like wine bibber in Proverbs 23.20, or did not, like unoutspeakable, <laughs> and uh, uh, um, that, that, didn't, uh, that, that didn't survive. But um, he followed Tyndale in firmly uh, keeping congregation, elder, love, and under other central New Testament terms that had been attacked by the Catholic Church. He, he retains those and keeps them. Um, but, but Coverdale 
Uh, his Bible really sets the stage for all the work that's going to follow. Really everything from Coverdale to the King James, with the exception of the Geneva, because the Geneva kind of, you, you have the, those English Bibles, then you gotta have the, the Geneva Bible that sits out here because it's not produced in England. It's, it's um, Coverdale, it, everything from Coverdale forward now, Matthews, um, the Great Bible, um, the, the Bishop's Bible, and then leading up to the King James, really will be building off the work of Coverdale. They will be taking what he did and, and expanding and, and uh, working around it. And then you'll get to the Geneva Bible, which Coverdale's involved with uh, in, a, in a very uh, um, early way. So there's a lot of Tyndale in the, cover, in, in the Geneva Bible, and that's thanks to Coverdale. And there's, uh, uh, um, then the, the, uh, the Bishop's Bible comes along and then the, again, the Bishop's Bible is gonna serve. We're gonna talk about the Bishop's Bible at length in, in a bit, because I think it's an important uh, uh, translation, um, not so much for its translation value, but for the process that it establishes. And then you have, the, and then leading to the King James Bible in, in 1611. Any questions? Anything we can we can expand upon the um, uh, um, Coverdale uh, um, uses, of course, as we said, the, the Latin, but not as much. The German uh, a lot. Luther's Bible is very important, and Zwingli's kind of uh, that the Swiss German uh, translation that Zwingli does. And it, um, again, produced in 1535. It will go through 20 editions. And that's for a work at this time, for the, the fluid nature of, the, of English and the English Bible at this time, it, um, that's a lot of editions. It will stay in print after his death. Um, and again, his Bible, Will, will span. His Bible will stay in print during Matthews's Bible. It will stay in print during the time of the Great Bible. It will be in print up to the time of the Geneva. It is really only the Geneva Bible that finally uh, um, supplants Coverdale completely because it's such a superior translation. And, um, and because now English, English has really changed by now. And, uh, and the Geneva will build upon that. But again, Coverdale's involved in that project as well. What else can we answer? Anything about uh, um, Coverdale, about uh, any of the people involved in that? Let's talk about Cramner just a little bit because Cramner is very, very important. Um, and, and Cramner, uh, Thomas Cramner, is uh, again 1489 to 1556. Um, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury during the reigns of Henry VIII, uh, Edward VI, and for a very brief time, Mary. Um, uh, Mary uh, um, arrests him, tortures him, um, Cramner is um, under duress of torture, recants um, the, his Protestant principles, um, but before he is executed, he recants his recantation. Um, but Mary, uh, uh, Mary's people use Mary and, and uh, Reginald Pohl, her archbishop, use this to great propaganda effect. They, they took, they, they, they produced um, Cramner's recantation, uh, can, uh, uh, um, recantations and, and printed them and distributed them. Um, but he, uh, uh, um, on the day of his execution, he's still gonna be executed. And he discovered that recanting didn't save his life. 
He was still going to be executed. And so as he is standing to be executed, he recants his recantation. And so, you know, people say, well, you know, what a coward. You know, he recanted. Um, You know, you would like to think, I mean, I would like to think that if I was put under torture, um, and, and, and the tortures at that time were awfully cruel. Uh, you know, you would like to think that you would um, withstand the torture and not, you know, deny the faith or deny some aspect of the faith. But there, there's, there's, no, there, there's, there's nothing in the Bible that guarantees that'll be the case. I mean, everyone's going to be there. I mean, that's a huge controversy in the early church. You know, what do we do with these people who had, um, during the persecutions before Constantine, under uh, who had, you know, renounced the faith, who had, had gone back to paganism, and, and now were wanting to come back now that it was safe? You know, that was a huge, you know, controversy in the early church. Um, and I think we can be a little, uh, uh, sometimes we can we can say, uh, well, you know, I would have, you know, I don't know if you, you know, who knows if you would, you would hope that you would, but there's no guarantee. Um, Cramner was subjected to uh, um, some pretty horrific torture, you know, uh, uh, and, and sometimes you, you, you know, if, if you've not experienced a lot of pain in your life, or I mean, really serious kind of pain. You, you, you know, there. I, I get migraine headaches really, really bad. I mean, rolling on the floor, throwing up kind of headaches, screaming. And um, fortunately, I don't remember them much after it happens, but I know it happens. And and there are times when when you you would you know I I know in my I, I've had I, I that I wish I would die. I said, you know, I wish I wish I would die instead of going through this pain. That's how much it hurts. Um, and so you don't know, you know, if someone says, I'll make the pain stop, if. Uh, you would hope that you wouldn't, but you never know. You don't know what, what that kind of uh, pain and torture is like sometimes. Um, Cramner is important because he writes and compiles the first two editions of the Book of Common Prayer. And, and so important is the Book of Common Prayer in the Church of England system that you will often see in, in your in, in a edition of the English Bible, even the King James, uh, you will see the Book of Common Prayer uh, in, connected with the Bible. Um, at that time, there weren't, uh, if you wanted to buy a Bible, you often went to the, they didn't keep a lot in stock. It's not like, you, know, you go to the bookstore and pull one off the shelf like you would do now and buy it. There's some of that, but typically you would order one from the printer. And you'd, you'd say, you know, I want this and this and this. And there were other attachments. You, you might, there might be a map, there might be this, and there would be a book of common prayer. And so different bindings, when you see different, ver- different King James Bibles especially, um, Sometimes you'll see the Book of Common Prayer in the front, and then the Old Testament, and then the Apocrypha, and then the New Testament. The Apocrypha always comes. The Apocrypha is going to be printed in all of these editions of the Bible, even the King James, up until later printings of the King James when it's finally removed. Um, sometimes the, the Book of Common Prayer will be at the back, but it's, it's, sometimes it'll be in the middle. I've seen, I've seen Bibles where it's, it's shoved in the middle between the, the Apocrypha and the New Testament. So the Book of Common Prayer is very, very important. Um, he was a, a uh, um, important um, figure. He doesn't change the church a lot, but he enables the Reformation in England to really take deep roots. Um, but he was uh, um, again. He was uh, he 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 wrote, he wrote the Thirty Nine Articles, which is the the uh, doctrinal statement for the Anglican Church, which which Elizabeth will modify to some degree when she comes to the, to, to reign. But he's uh, 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 widely widely important. 
Uh, the other one we already talked about, uh, Thomas Cromwell, um, who again kind of comes in this big convergence of these four individuals, uh, Henry VIII, Miles Coverdale, Cromwell, and Cramner, who come to kind of together all at the same time to produce, uh, to allow the production of the Coverdale Bible. And um, he was the uh, great uh, uh, Oliver Cromwell, who will be the, the, the protectorate, who will overthrow the monarchy, will have Charles I executed. Um, he is the great, great grandson of Thomas Cromwell's sister. And, 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 and he uh, um, carries, the, Oliver Cromwell carried the Cromwell name. So these are all, kind of, all these people are kind of uh, interconnected. But sometimes uh, um, Thomas Cromwell and Oliver, they're, they're confused because they're both English history and they're roughly, you know, roughly same era, just a little bit later on the other, on the other end.